I'd like to first thank the committee uh, for this award. It's a real pleasure to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in my group over the last five or so years. And what I'm going to talk about uh, is the th work that motivated the work that the award was for. The work was for scalable inference techniques, which we've been building over the last half decade in my group. But it was really all motivated by building a new style of data management system that we call Deep Dive. So I'll first tell you about Deep Dive, and then I'll tell you about the scalable inference techniques. So Deep Dive is sort of what we call a dark data system. If you haven't heard of a dark data system, these are sort of like ETL systems on steroids. So just like an ETL system wants to take semi-structured or lightly structured data and put it into a SQL store, we want to do the same thing. Except we're going to look at things like natural language processing. We're going to look at things like tables, charts, figures, and increasingly images. Right? Now, this is a problem that has been studied by this community and others for, in some cases, decades. But one thing that's happened very recently uh, in Deep Dive and some other projects is that the quality has passed a particular threshold. And in particular, we now have quality in some applications across a range of domains where you actually prefer that machines do these extraction tasks. That is, against professional annotators and scientific volunteers, we're actually getting higher quality uh, than those people at these same tasks, sometimes compared to decades-long extraction efforts. No one cares how fast these things run until you can meet that quality uh, benchmark, and then they start to complain that it doesn't run fast enough. Now, the difference between the way Deep Dive frames this problem and a lot of what goes on in traditional sort of databases, data mining, and sort of data cleaning kinds of operations is that if you look at a series of talks here over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, you see people doing great work in extraction, great work in integration, and great work in cleaning. Right? Each of these are very, very hard problems. Now, what we decided to do in Deep Dive was frame all of them as a giant statistical inference problem. Now, at first, it sounds like a crazy and stupid idea. Why would you take three hard problems and put them together and try and put this statistical goo on top? What could that possibly buy you? Well, there are two reasons that I think this is not an insane idea. The first reason is that actually every real system that we've actually built actually has, all, has an extraction, an integration, and a cleaning component to it. And the second reason is actually if the way these systems are typically built, you don't have an idea about the end-to-end -end application quality as you build each one of these components. And this leads to sort of an Amdel's law of quality, where you're trying to build your cleaning or extraction component, but you have no idea if it helps your end task of actually extracting information or getting out the high-quality data that you want. In contrast, in the approach that I'm advocating here, what ends up happening is you can focus on the part of that ETL pipeline that's going to get you highest quality first. And that's why we're able to go inside some companies and actually within a month or a month and a half actually compete with, in some ways, beat professional human annotators. Now, one of the other aspects of what we were trying to do is that most of the interesting data problems that we were going after actually are not computer scientists in the loop. They're these new kinds of people, data scientists, if you like, who don't really understand statistics that well. They don't understand you know, sort of data management that well. And they have to they have an application they really care about, or they're domain scientists. And so what we tried to do was build a declarative system that abstracted from them all of the algorithms that they could possibly write. And so for the last five years, we've been building these systems that have no algorithms underneath the covers, meaning you cannot write down a particular algorithm inside Deep Dive. Instead, you only express the choices or the random variables that you want to uh, model in your ETL workflow, and we do all the algorithmic choices for you. Now, this is where scale really comes in. So it's been great because we've enabled a bunch of non-CS users. These are people in neuroscience, biology, uh, law enforcement, who are able to write deep dive programs. But now, scale is a massive, massive challenge. Just like in a database, actually processing a file isn't too hard if you're doing it in a one-off way. But once you introduce that layer of abstraction, becomes a very challenging systems problem. And that's really why we started, uh, we realized this about five years ago, and we started writing lots and lots of papers about how to scale up machine learning. Okay? Now, of course, in these talks, I, the first thing to do is definitely to thank a bunch of people uh, who've, who've helped, and a tremendous number of people we, I, I and my lab owe debt to. The first uh, people I'd like to thank are the deep dive team who've done a great amount of work, and two of them I'd particularly like to call out. One of them is Mike Caffarella. So about a year ago, DARPA gave us a, a pile of money and told us that they'd like us to start a company. Uh, and I called Mike and said, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Mike, can you come out and uh, visit Stanford, uh, take a leave, and come hang out with us? And Mike did that. And one of the things that's been really tremendous over the last year is to see the unbelievable amount of love that he gets from the open source community for founding things like Hadoop and HBase and all the rest. And I just want to highlight that in this community, we sometimes lose track of the massive contribution that Mike has made. And he's just a great human being. The other person I'd like to thank is Se Zhang, who's my student who just graduated. Without Se's hard work and creativity, Deep Dive simply wouldn't have happened. 
Now, there's a huge amount more people that we owe to, and this is an incomplete list, and I really thank all the community who's been really supportive as we've charted this weird path through data management, machine learning, mathematical programming, and all the rest, and been really accepting and welcoming of what are really weird and strange papers sometimes. Right. Now, two people who deserve a special credit here. Now, Mike talked a little bit before in his talk about linear algebra and optimization, mathematical programming, and basically when I got to Wisconsin, two people, Stephen Wright and Ben Reck, basically helped me to do a, basically a PhD in optimization. And it was fantastic. I learned a ton from them, and I really want to thank them. I also want to thank my actual advisor, who I try to strive to be like every day, because he's one of the most patient and nice people I know, and incredibly, incredibly smart. If you know me well, you know that this is actually all a head fake for one thank you, which is for my wife. Uh, my wife is my unfair advantage. She believes in me when I don't. Uh, she's a fantastic human being, and she's helped us a tremendous amount in actually getting deep dive off the ground into the hands of real users. There's also a huge number of systems out there that have a very similar goal and that we've learned from over the last couple years. So they're the industrial systems. We're great friends with the Watson research folks and the knowledge graph uh, people who have done tremendous things and been very open with their infrastructures, telling us how they're solving very similar problems. I think Luna once sent me a paper that had our calibration plots in there that the knowledge graph guys were using, and this brought a tear to my eye, just the fact that we were able to exchange information with those guys. Now, I'm an academic bigot. I think a lot of the most interesting work has gone on in this area in academia, and there are a bunch of really great projects that I won't have time to put into proper context inside this talk. So now let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming. So the problem that motivated Deep Dive when I was looking around the campus looking for users and when I would talk to scientists around campus is that the world's scientific knowledge was accessible. It was accessible in a way like never before. If you knew what you were looking for, you knew the keywords that you were after, you knew the DOI, no problem, Google has solved this problem. You put it into Google, and back comes the information. The problem they were struggling with was that the information for even the narrowest of scientific questions was simply not readable. They couldn't possibly process all the information that was out there that was relevant to very, very detailed questions inside their science. Now, worse yet, most of the problems they were facing were sort of in, almost in what Mike was calling the dumb analytics mode. If they could just get the data out of all the papers and the reports that were out there and put it into a standard Postgres database, they would actually make a leap inside their science. So for example, in climate and biodiversity, we work with some scientists who basically needed to assemble the world's largest fossil record to try and understand the impact of climate change on biodiversity. And they had been entering papers for over a decade, two continuous person decades, as I'll show you, just entering information about the climate and where fossils were found. We also see this in other places. We have a bunch of pilots inside Stanford uh, Hospital working with health and genomics and a bunch of different areas in cancer as well. Another place where we saw this also was in financial markets. I was part of a company that uh, sells to Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. And there, the name of the game, as Mike mentioned, is getting as much information into those models as possible. Okay. So for all these reasons, looking at these applications, it's really about just getting first. We're at the stage where we can get the data in one place. And five years ago, this was a very, very major challenge. So let me drill into one of these to show you the type of information that we're actually extracting and why this is a hard and interesting challenge. All right. All right. So we asked an extremely naive question, which was, could we build a machine to do this reading task for us? Now, I don't mean that it's going to read like poetry and be moved by what it's reading, and it's going to take that information in and feel something. There's no AI weirdness. I just mean take the bits that are in the files and do the task that the person does to populate that structured database. And unfortunately, this requires a little bit of inference to actually happen. It's not as simple as copying the strings in. Okay. So here's an actual data, the thing that we built a couple years back, which is called Paleo Deep Dive. So the goal here is that we have a bunch of PDF documents that look like this. And what the scientists were doing was taking them and basically entering them into a Postgres database. That's actually what was going on. This database contained where they found the fossils and what time period it was and where in the tree of life the critter that they found actually came from. So to a first approximation, what we're going to do is take that text and try and produce that structured database. And that pipe between those two is going to be all statistical inference. Now, our approach is extremely, extremely aggressive. If you've ever written an ETL pipeline, you know that you make lots and lots of choices as you go from the raw text into the structured form. And what we're going to tell you to do is instead of writing an if statement and try and write some complicated reasoning to figure out what the right thing to do is, just express your uncertainty. And the way you express your uncertainty is you basically declare a random variable. And what we're going to do is create these programs, these deep dive programs, and I'll show you one in a second. We have billions of random variables. Okay? And so this is where, again, scalability comes in. If you're an expert, we're creating factor graphs here that are terabytes or sometimes hundreds of terabytes in one of our largest installations. And we're trying to do principal probabilistic reasoning on top of them. Now, if you haven't followed machine learning closely, it's gone through this inflection point recently where it went to being something that was sort of 
kind of delivering on quality to being able to deliver really amazing quality. And let me show you one of these examples that we built in our lab. Now, this is an actual document that we want to read. I'm not asking you to read it. It's too small. But the information we care about is buried in tables like this one. So a piece of information we'd be interested in is, for example, that in this region called Obora, we found this thing called Mora Valamacryas. Now, this Mora Valamacryas is actually a kind of cockroach. If you love cockroaches, this is hot stuff. You want to make sure this is inside your database, because it'll tell you all crazy things about how the world works. As a database person, you look at this image and you say, oh my gosh, how am I going to do the extraction from this? I have to figure out how to do the OCR. There are some of those choices or random variables I told you about. You have to figure out that there's a relationship expressed in the text. You have to figure out how large is the span of the text. All of those choices are basically going to be random variables. If you solve all of those low-level challenges, you still have higher-level challenges. It turns out in this data set, there are 40, more than 40 regions that are referred to as Obora. And on its face, we have no idea which one we're talking about. Now, if we look at the text of the article, this is going into the text, not the caption, we get what seems very lucky, but we published an ACL paper. It's not as lucky as you would think. We actually get the text in the article that says, this is the Obora site that we're talking about, and in this case, the GPS coordinates. So if we go in and we do the deep NLP, and we're actually able to extract this information, we can actually link back and create a table of very, very high resolution data that's comparable to what the person could create. So the takeaway from this example is that this inference of being able to go across both simultaneously text and tables at the same time and be able to infer across all of them when you have all of this information, which is called joint probabilistic inference, is really critical to getting high quality. So let's see this. We built this a couple years ago, uh, and now it's been released for a while. So we compared against a human annotated database. This is called PaleoDB, 330 volunteers. Uh, that's been running on this for more than a decade two continuous person decades of people, we have the Postgres logs, reading papers and putting them into this database. Okay. Now we decided with Su to actually build a machine created one on top of Deep Dive, and it's something we call Paleo Deep Dive. And we're really excited that it was just featured in Nature about two months ago. So what Paleo Deep Dive does is basically try and replicate exactly what the humans are doing to populate that database. Now I'll argue now, somewhat controversially, that in the future, you're gonna want machines to do the tasks that these people were doing, not the humans, and I'll show you two reasons why. So the first reason is kind of obvious. When you turn the machine on the first day, it can read about 10x more documents. It's a machine, it doesn't get tired, we just buy more cores and run the thing, okay? In contrast, it takes two continuous person decades to populate the database in PaleoDB. Another more surprising fact is that when we turned it on, we found that we got 100-fold more extractions than the annotators, okay? Now, you may wonder out of 10x more documents, where are these 10x more facts coming from inside those documents? And it turns out that the glib summary is that people are pretty lazy. Right? So when people look at these documents, they extract some portions of them, and then they extract a little bit more, and then maybe they neglect some tables or they neglect the appendix. They don't put all of the information into the database. And as a result, they mark the table as actually being, uh, a paper as actually being read, but they haven't actually put anything in there. So in other examples, we've seen the same thing. Usually not a factor of 10, but you know, 30 or 40% of the data is all that's actually extracted by professional annotators. Okay. Now the second question you may ask is about quality and precision. This used to be a major problem with machine learning-based approaches. What is the accuracy of actually going from the raw text into the table? What is the precision of all those facts that we claim are correct? Okay. Now the first question is to ask how good are humans at this task? And this is the second critical reason why we think machines will replace them at this task. And this is something that has to do with these PaleoDB volunteers. So we actually went through and assessed the quality of data that they, the volunteers were putting in compared to the experts. And we found one very large class of errors that we've seen in a bunch of applications that's very interesting. And basically, the error goes like this. They read the text, and they say, oh, I know that this new rock formation is actually called by a new name. Obora has been renamed. When, that's, when they're correct, they put that good information in your database, that's pretty good. You have a good fact that's in your database. When they're wrong, it's catastrophic. It's sort of lost to the ages. It's very difficult to detect the error. But even when they get it right, it's not great. And the reason it's not great is that they're not applying this mapping systematically. So your database is a mishmash of some annotators putting it in the new terms and some putting it in the old terms. And this happens a large fraction of the 16% of errors that they make. Now, in contrast, our machine makes systematic errors. It's just a function of a small set of rules. It's online. You can see it. Very, very simple. And as a result, we can get closer to what the experts want to see than the volunteers. And so perhaps not surprisingly, our quality is higher. Now, of course, I picked an example where substantially higher. But we actually compared across all predicates that were inside the database in, in this Postgres instance, and statistically significantly uh, better on three of them. And then on the rest, we were no worse. Okay? 
So we were really excited about this, and this is something that's in actually active use. So for these reasons, I would argue that actually we want machines to do this because they have these systematic properties. Now, of course, we're not interested in doing things with fossils. We want to scale this out to a bunch of different places. We had a paper in bioinformatics last month about doing this for drug repurposing. We're doing this in hospitals with genomics, helping with rare disease diagnosis. We just got some hits, actually, uh, within the last week. But maybe you look at this and you say, you know, there's sort of two things I want to disabuse you of. Maybe you look at this and you say, well, those are a bunch of liberal academics. They're not very good at this. Big business is going to be the, come to the rescue here, and they're going to annotate all of their data. And maybe I would have agreed with you until we started selling products to them. And then I realized, actually, companies are quite bad at this, actually substantially worse. And we've gone into a number of enterprises where we've actually competed with the professional annotators who do this as their job and seen that we can get matching to inter-annotator agreement, sometimes within a month or two months of these deployments. And the other thing I'd like to show you is that this idea of integrating all the data together is really building on a lot of NLP, but it's also extending NLP. And so there's this ma major competition every year called TAC KBP, where everyone who gets money from various NLP grants competes. And last year, I think four of the top five entries were built on Deep Dive, and the top two came out of my lap. So we're actually able to compete with and beat a lot of these NLP-based approaches by building and taking this, this systems view. Okay? Now, if you were paying close attention, you noticed that there was a database that they started with, and they had been building it for a decade, and we were just adding more tuples to it. And you may wonder, well, what if there's no database? And let me start by telling you, let me tell you this little story about uh, human trafficking, where there's no database that starts, uh, that was there when we started. So this project was when DARPA came to us and basically asked us to help out with a project, and a bunch of other people to help out with a project, to look at human trafficking. So human trafficking is the process where people are forced into sexual or work slavery, uh, basically against their will. And the hypothesis here was that we could identify those trafficked individuals uh, by looking at the prices they were offering for various sexual services and checking if they were lower cost or offering riskier sexual services than competitors. Okay. Now, if you're wondering why DARPA is interested in this, it turns out that people who sell other people generally bad, like they're terrorists or they're drug dealers. So tracking them down is like in the national interest. Right? Now, what the heck does this have to do with database research? Well, it turns out that all, like everything else, everything is online. Prostitution has gone online. Basically, web ads are everywhere where people are advertising their wares, and this is how you know, they contact their customers. So we can scrape all of that data with the help of a bunch of teams and then do all this extraction. Now, to be clear about what we're doing here, this is high-resolution information that we need. We're basically building like the best prostitute pricing model for every location in the US. Okay. This is what your tax dollars are going to if you're a US citizen. Anyway, so if you think about it, we need to know what sexual services are offered. Trust me, there are some strange ones. We need to know about the ethnicities of the people involved, the location, the attractiveness, the, whether they're willing to travel, to meet you. All this crap has to go into the model to figure out how much they're going to charge. Okay? Now, a second challenge, in addition to this high resolution data, is whether or not the text is expressed clearly. Scientists want to be understood. But actually, as we've deployed this system with real law enforcement, something that we've seen is that they're actually taking countermeasures against us. They're trying to make sure that we can't extract the information from the text. So this is obfuscated and, and terrible text to deal with. Okay. So just to be clear, the way this works is there's a bunch of web text. Uh, we get a lot of our data from NASA and JPL. Chris Matman, I love you. Uh, and then there's Juliana Ferrer, uh, who also has a crawling team. And they basically crawl a bunch of websites that are out there and give us data. Okay. Deep Dive then produces most of these high-end extractions. It's the only one that produces things like rates of service and all the really disgusting attributes come out of our system. Okay? We also do a bunch of classifiers on top about is there drug use, forced prostitution, and so on. And then this is consumed by law enforcement and NGOs. Okay? Now, I can't talk too much about the results from it. It got a bunch of press about six months ago. I was all over the TV uh, for a while. Um, it was sort of embarrassing for my parents to say, like, oh, my son works on sex trafficking, but whatever. <laughs> Anyway, um, but one thing we can report is that actually the uh, New York DA is using Memex in all of their ongoing investigations. And if you read some of the press clippings, there have been a large number of arrests based on, on this data. And we're, we're really excited to contribute there uh, with the data sort of extraction piece. Now, just to give you some more numbers, in less than in the, before we got operational, we processed you know, 35 million documents with precision well above 90% as assessed by law enforcement annotators. Okay. All right. So, that was basically the application motivation, uh, to try and get people in law enforcement and biology and the rest to be able to use these systems. The technical piece is how do they use that is this declarative language. And this declarative language allows for something that we call algorithmic independence that we think is absolutely critical for these machine learning systems to take the next step. Okay? 
So let me give you an example that's a little bit more pleasant than uh, human trafficking, which is extracting things from sentences like this one. US President Barack Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, honored all mothers on Mother's Day. What a happy sentence, okay? Now what we want to extract from this sentence is Barack and Michelle Obama are married. Very, very simple relation extraction task at a mention level. Okay. So how does it work? So this is all online. You can check the code and play with it. The first step of any of these things is basically to run natural language processing. NLP has taken a massive leap forward, and you basically get out the parts of speech, the named entity recognition, who's a person, and so on. Okay? It's not perfect, but it's good. In Deep Dive, this is declared in a nice declarative statement that I don't expect you to parse, but basically we handle the processing for you. Then the second phase is to generate candidates. And this is basically like really bad extractors that just say, here are the potential candidates are for who's a person in the text. Or we'll say, the people that are potentially married are those that are mentioned in the same sentence. This is just setting the domain for who's going to uh, be extracted. All standard SQL processing, for weird historical reasons, we write it as a data log-like rules. Okay? And then also there are these features. And these features are really critical, but increasingly they're handled by libraries. Basically what they do is they allow you to go and say things like, the words that occur between the entities in the sentence are indicative of the relationship. And here the uh, possessive and wife is a good feature. Now all that gets tied together into this little rule here, and this rule declares a binary classifier that just says who's married and who's not, and ties together all those features by weight. Okay? Now what's amazing about this framework, though, is that if some choice along that path, named entity recognition or any of those things, had been something where you were uncertain about the outcome, you could model it, and that is the language is compositional, and so you can build very sophisticated pipelines without worrying about the intermediate algorithms that are run at each one of these stages. That's the whole program. No reference to algorithms, just features. Deep Dive does all the rest. Okay. okay, now one bit that I wanted to stress to you, which I think is a critical technical point, is each one of those choices are random variables. We estimate the marginal probability for them. And this is a very deep point to me. So each one of those random variables we estimate, and some of those we ask the user to label, maybe a couple hundred. And then the idea is we check for all those that are, say, labeled with probability 0.9, we would expect 90% of those to be correct. So on the x-axis here, we see the output probability. And on the y-axis, we see the accuracy of all those holdouts. So here's a real calibration plot. This is the thing I referred to earlier. And we see that, is that five? Yeah, eight. Sounds great. <laughs> um, we see here that if we look at the bin that, for example, is 80% correct, about 80% of those tuples should actually be correct. Okay? Now, why this is so critical is that algorithmic independence allows us to define the meaning of the output without referring to any algorithm whatsoever. It's independent of the algorithm that's used to compute it. And that means that people can reason and debug these systems without having to understand, are we using Gibbs sampling and SVM or a conditional random field? They just have to understand how the output is and to give us more information. And the proof is in the pudding in the sense that we've had people in biology, neurobiology, a huge number of areas, actually write deep dive programs. Okay. Now the whole thing is that algorithmic independence actually requires that we build an insanely fast engine. And that's basically what we spent the last half decade doing, is optimizing the crap out of how to do statistical inference on modern hardware to get and pick up all that, uh, all that uh, goodness that uh, the hardware people have given us. Okay? So I like stupid names. That will become apparent in the next couple of slides. We have this project called Dimwitted, which was looking at NUMA, SIMD, all the rest for how to do uh, main memory analytics. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, it's a systems problem. There's a key balance between two forces that I'd like to highlight for you. Uh, there's this one force on one side, which is what we call statistical efficiency. This is basically what optimization people worry about. Every time I touch the data, I take some steps, and they worry about minimizing the number of steps. However, modern hardware prefers some steps more than others, and we call that hardware efficiency. And we're trying basically to balance these two for every approach. And what we did in this paper is basically chart out many of the models and put them somewhere in this spectrum of statistical versus hardware efficiency and try to figure out how to make the most balanced system possible. And just to give you some rough numbers, these are two or three orders of magnitude faster than competitor approaches uh, that are out there and are widely used if you correctly balance them. So there's a lot of fat in modern hardware in NUMA kinds of architectures. Okay. Now to give you one more detailed piece, the last thing I want to tell you is this, give you a little crash course in analytics to appreciate one stupid name and stupid idea that we had. And it works like this. So basically machine learning, a large fraction of it, works as follows. I have an x, a vector that I'm interested in, and I have a bunch of data, which are my yi's here. n here is in the billions. And what I want to do is I want to find the x that minimizes some cost function. 
Okay? This is deep learning, recommendation, classification, a whole bunch of other things. And it turns out that the universe, for reasons I'm happy to talk about offline, has converged on about the dumbest algorithm you can imagine to solve this equation, or this minimization problem, which is called stochastic gradient descent. And it works as follows. It starts at a particular guess of x, it looks at a particular individual term, it then computes an estimate of what it thinks is the direction that's gonna minimize the function, which is called the gradient, and then it walks in that direction. And what it does that's important for us is billions and billions of tiny little iterations, okay? So from a database systems perspective, if we wanna scale this up, we have to be able to build a parallel engine. All of our speed up now comes from things like NUMA, comes from things like SIMD, low level and high level parallelism. That's what we need to do here. Now here, there are these insane conflicts. We're reading and writing X very, very fast. And computing the gradient actually takes sometimes less than, fewer than 100 instructions or 20 cycles. It's a really fast operation. So how the heck can we hope to speed this up with parallelism when we have all of these read-write conflicts? Serializability, linearizability, they all seem hopeless. So what genius idea did my students and I come up with? We decided to comment out all the locks, okay? So basically we would let these things completely race and run free. It's an algorithm that we called hog wild. And we did slightly more than just comment out the locks. We proved that actually it's possible that the algorithm will still converge under technical conditions. We can guarantee it. It will converge to the right answer, even though there are these benign race conditions that are going on, okay? Now, there's a bunch of papers on this. It's a large area of stuff that we've, we've been doing over the last couple of years. But this is the hog wild idea. Basically, the algorithms are only statistically correct, and so it doesn't really matter if you have occasional race conditions internally. Now, when you look at this thing and this hog wild, you say, well, it has a stupid name, and it seems like a, a crazy idea. This is probably only confined to academics. And if you asked me to bet on paper submission whether that would be true, I would say 100% yes, this is just an academic paper. But oddly enough, this has been implemented by almost every web company, uh, and there's one in particular that deserves love, and I'll show you why on the next slide. Okay? So if you haven't followed machine learning, the height of machine learning is that Google recognized cats a couple years ago. Very soon afterwards, Microsoft recognized dogs with their project Cortana. They released that last year. And next year, we think we're gonna have AI overlords that are gonna conquer all of us, okay? So this is what's going on inside machine learning are these deep learning frameworks that are basically doing things like image recognition, voice, and text, okay? Now, the reason I love Microsoft in particular was the following quote that was in Wired Magazine, that they said that their key secret sauce for Project Atom was using a technology called, of all things, hog wild. Now, two things about this made my troll heart sing. <laughs> One was they got the exclamation point right, which is part of the name if you ever cite us. There is an exclamation point. And the second part was that the writer expressed that they were shocked that a company would come out and publicly say that they were using something that was called hog wild, the of all things. And that made me absolutely ecstatic. And for that, Microsoft, I will always love you, okay? Now, this is, a, all joking aside, this is actually a much larger trend. The ability to relax consistency, which in databases we've struggled with, having these weaker models of consistency, to be able to get big wins in terms of performance is something that you're seeing play out again and again and again. And here are some of the people who've uh, helped us. We definitely thank the Pivotal people and the Impala people for implementing these things in Madlib, Google, and Twitter as well. Uh, really great stuff there. We, we appreciate all of that stuff. And there's a lot of work going on in this space, a lot of it in machine learning, but also some of it in the system side. And I think there's a lot more to do on the system side. So with that, I will breeze through very quickly the, what I'm gonna do future, because I think I'm running out of time. The two things uh, that I wanted to talk about that I'm gonna do next, uh, and we're really thinking about is text and tables and images we haven't really solved in any measure. There's a lot of information we're leaving on the floor. Every time we talk to scientists in cancer, biology, and even uh, customers in uh, the enterprise, they have interesting image data around. It's somehow just proliferating right now, and it's a huge opportunity for our community to try and figure out what the heck do we do with this from a data management perspective. The other thing is, is we've worked a lot on trying to make this more broadly usable, uh, but we don't really know how to do it. This is what most of the work that's gone on over the last couple of years, is how do we make it easier and faster to build these knowledge bases? We think thinking about features, not algorithms, is one level of abstraction, but there are many, many more to get these things working reliably in the real world. And if you see these crazy papers we've been writing for the last couple of years, named after street artists and other stuff, those are all about trying to figure out how feature engineering can actually be cast as a data management problem. And so that's one thing we're really excited about. So to conclude, I really told you three things. The first is that dark data that's out there, that's text, tables, and images, really is helpful with a large number of what we call macroscopic questions. That's when you have to assemble all the information that's out there about a particular task, your business, a science, to be able to answer one of these higher level analytic questions. And we're really excited to build those kinds of applications. 
The second thing is this principle that we've been hammering on for a couple of years, which is that probabilistic inference leads to algorithmic independence. I can define the meaning of the output independently of how I computed it. And that means that you as a user do not have to understand what I'm doing under the covers. And this enables more people to be you know, participating in these high-end systems. And the last bit is this idea and this trade-off between hardware and statistical efficiency. And it turns out you can beat the crap out of these statistical algorithms and they still work. And that's a huge opportunity for people who know how to build balanced data processing systems, which is really this community. How do we put all of these ingredients together and build big, reliable data science pipelines for the next couple of years? Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Questions? Oh, come on. Have you applied deep dive to VLDB papers? Oh, no. No applications to VLDB papers, only uh, other scientists who are willing to sweat over them. <laughs> so. Other questions? Could you comment on the use of array stores in machine learning and all that? I'm story? sorry, I didn't. Comment on the use of array stores and wh what do you think? how you think they can contribute to making these systems faster. So you said the thread store? Well, sorry, array I mean, stores. The thing array that stores. Mike talked oh, yeah, yeah. About. yeah. So, yeah, so Mike talked a little bit about array stores. And as he mentioned, I have some different ideas. I think that the programming model for array stores versus underlying uh, systems, there's a possibility for us to hide some of those abstractions. Now, right now, it's a really an academic question. You know, do you have to expose array stores? People have codes that are already written over array kinds of operations. Do you want to support those, or do you want to support something else? And for purely academic reasons, uh, we think that there's a way to get, raise a higher level of abstraction uh, where you don't have to expose that, but you can still get BLAST or MKL kind of performance. And we're working with those hardware vendors on, on those types of things. And it's true, if you, if you don't block and tile appropriately, then you're, you're just out of luck on those things. So you have to figure out it's a hard system challenge how to actually ep execute linear algebra efficiently. Hi. Uh, great talk, and congratulations on the award. Uh, two quick questions for your features engineering aspect. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. you're essentially saying, let's not think of algorithms, think in terms of features. But mm -hmm. you also mentioned, mentioned deep learning, right? So can we even automate feature extraction? Sure, sure, sure. That's number one. Number two is when you're essentially saying, well, we can beat human experts, right? Clearly, no, I never said that. I said I beat human an annotator and volunteers and get quality that's closer to experts than uh, the volunteers. I stand corrected. Yeah. But the, the question really fundamentally is if you're saying that machines can give you 100x more annotations, sure. are all those annotations really meaningful? For Great example, question. are you really you know, producing noise that a human said, well, this is interesting but not really useful? Great. Great question. So the first question about deep learning, uh, both are very insightful questions. The first le lecture, a thing about deep learning is, can deep learning op automate even the feature construction pipelines? And for things like images, they've had a great track record of doing this. We actually released a deep learning framework that's used by a bunch of scientists. And I can't explain why it works, but it freaking works. And I have no idea why. So that's great. If they can do that in text, and Chris Manning and those guys are pushing on doing it in text, and there are maybe five startups trying to do that as well, that would be great. It would automate feature engineering. One piece that I would say is we gave a, I gave a talk at NIPS last year about our own automated feature library. And you can automate more of it than I would have expected two or three years ago. So it's really an open question how all of these technologies come together to try and automate that process. And when I was hinting about features, not algorithms, as sort of stage one, getting rid of features and figuring out how they interact in a way of like labeling data is really very, very interesting. So I don't know if deep learning is the answer, but it's, very, it's an interesting component of whatever comes next. And then your second question uh, was about I'm sorry, can you repeat it? The 100x. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That, that we're, we're, the question, we're the facts we're extracting meaningful. And it's an interesting question. When we first, this is actually one of the first things that came back when we started talking to the scientists. And they said, well, is, are, is the data we're even getting back meaningful? Maybe our experts are throwing this on the ground. Now, there are, two, there are two parts of this that are a little bit suspect. The first is what's meaningful to one expert is not meaningful to the other. And I used to say this sort of glib line where I would say, if you look at the expert in whales, he thinks the snails guy is a hack, and so he doesn't extract anything about the snails. But actually, if you look in a more detailed way, and this is actually in the paper, you see that they're dropping on the ground legitimate facts. Is it an order of magnitude? Probably not. Right? You always have these sort of tails that go off. It's different by domain. In some domains, the humans are actually pretty good at extracting the information. It may be very tedious for them to do. They have very strict guidelines. They've gone through it for a while. Inside enterprises, so far our experience has been that the facts we extract make their heads explode. So we have a very small set of things, but when they see, oh my god, we dropped that on the ground, or we didn't know that like, a particular type of injury was increasing over time, 
that high resolution data very often is surprising to them. So I don't have a solid compelling reason telling you that all that 100x is you know, better than what they had before, but clearly some of it is. And as Mike mentioned, they're often looking for things in the tail. And so whenever you show them one of those rare events that they could have missed for one versus the other, they're very much willing to invest in these kinds of approaches. So it's a very interesting question. It's one we struggle with. Clearly, the second round of data has to be very large to make up for the fact that it's not the first thing that a human reader would extract. Great, great point. Um, please excuse my natural skepticism, but how do you know all those race conditions are benign? Ah, uh, great question. So we have a, so the race conditions are not benign in the traditional sense. What they are is what's going on is we have uh, atomicity in Hogwild is what you're referring to at the level of loads and stores. That's what the hardware provides to us. And so we look at that. Actually, we can go below that now. We can actually go down to bit level, but that's a separate topic. And so what we're basically saying is even if you had the most pessimistic right there, but the floating point value was actually preserved, then how much could it affect the convergence rate? And what the theorem says is basically if you can bound the staleness of the update, so that update is coming from some old version, if you can bound that old version st staleness, then you can actually prove that it's not going to destroy the model too much. It may slow you down. But if you want to think about this more intuitively, you're basically minimizing these in a big bowl. And what's happening is, is when you, the convex functions look like a big bowl. And as you go down, when you get the wrong components, you sort of bounce around to a different piece of the bowl. But you still always know reliably where to go down if you ever quiesce. And so the theory basically tells you that these, these race conditions, although they could be sort of catastrophic, never occur in any serial execution according to conventional theory, are actually not too bad. And the thing that's amazing is it actually works in situations where the theory doesn't apply. We have no convergence rates for deep learning, but that's one of the places where it's most widely used. And people just use hog wild and say, hey, it seems to converge to the same answer. So there's a, still a pretty big gap in our theoretical understanding. But for convex functions, we know how to prove exactly when it converges and when it doesn't. Thank you. Sure. When you um, oh, integrate, sure. when you, in, you said this is great for ETL. Um, if you're integrating certain um, financial information like salaries that are calculated in different ways in, in different companies or different sure, countries, sure. or integrating um, the notion of profit, which has a sure. million different ways of being being calculated, um, are you are you able to integrate that kind of data into something that is actually producing a rational you know answer on it's really apples to apples um, wonder, integration? Wonder, absolutely wonderful question. And of course, you identify the thing that we can't do well. So thanks, Bill. Uh, <laughs> No, so we actually were installed in a couple of financial services companies, and very, just as you mentioned, very basic things like how they calculate the profitability of particular financial instruments changes radically over time. The denominators are not what we would think. We would plug in our N and their N were different. Those types of integration problems are things that require very heavy interaction to understand the business rules and business process. The thing that we can do, which honestly I don't think you need probabilistic stuff for, but it's built into sort of our working model, is you can show them, hey, something's weird and not matching up here. We need expertise here because the profit that we're calculating, you know, way one versus your internal tools are different. And so we have to go through, and that's what we're going through with customers right now, doing that. When I talk about the integration, what I mean is when they have sort of ontological integration, where they have the same term, like a medical term, that's used externally by providers, but internally they have a different code for it, that kind of mapping we can do pretty automatically. Things about business rules and logic are my nightmare right now, but thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think you mentioned about the staleness control, which has a bound on the staleness. But I was just wondering, without the staleness control, is that means that without consistency, a lot of uh, parallel calculation is just uh, wasted because uh, it, when you write it back, uh, you overwrite some of things before. <laughs> which, but uh, I mean, that waste, that waste still exists even you have a bound. It just oh, you great question. minimize it to, I mean, from maybe 90% of the waste to maybe 50% of waste. It's an interesting way to look at it. So one, and you touched on a very deep point. So one of the things that I talked about was that stochastic gradient descent, this particular algorithm, is very widely used. And one of the reasons it's widely used is the acknowledgment going in is that there's a lot of noise in your data. So you're actually looking at very noisy training examples, or you're looking at images, and a lot of it is noise. So you have already a very high noise ceiling that you can't get below. Like you could get an answer with more degrees of precision, but it wouldn't really be meaningful. 
And so as you say, this waste that's there is sort of already present in the data. There's data modeling error. There's all these other types of errors. And we're well below that noise floor. And if you really look at the, what the convergence rates are telling you, they're telling you that we can converge to that noise floor, not the true model. No one can actually say anything about the true model. So that slop that you're talking with is already built into the algorithm. In some way, we're leveraging it by doing this hog wild stuff. It's a great observation. Thank you. Oh, good, Sergey? Yeah, my. Uh, maybe after this we can close the session. Uh, so the question I had is that uh, you talked about declarative specification, yep. but one of the facets that has an impact on the kind of models you generate is often the training data. Yep. And I can understand in cases there is C of data is all fine, but in general for an enterprise, let's say yep. most of the small, medium, even large businesses, Picking that training data is pretty non-trivial. Yep. And I want to have your thoughts on picking that training data or as the data drifts or the business questions drift, how you keep you updated. Because I think over scalability, uh, feature engineering and this problem are far more important in the next seven, eight years. So. Yeah, I totally agree. And so one thing I want to agree with there very strongly is that scalability is just a mechanism for feature engineering and assessing quality. But you mentioned how do we get training data for this. And one of the techniques that we've been using in these types of systems is to basically lower the quality of training data dramatically. So we use a technique that was popularized about 10 or 15 years ago called distance supervision, where we assume up front that our, our labels are very, very noisy. And so we allow people to express these sort of nice declarative rules. Now, there's actually a theorem that we can show that says something like, uh, as we add in more of these noisy sources, we can actually get close and approximate the actual underlying distribution so that the noisy sources don't hurt us too much. And that's one of the engineering tricks we're using. But you raised a second point in there, which was what happens when the training, when the concepts start to shift over time? And we see this especially when we look through like historical records inside uh, scientific applications or when you look inside financial applications, they may change how their policies are reported or recorded over time if they're an insurance company, for example. And so in those cases, you do have to actually monitor the model quite well. And right now, well, that's what you pay us for. No, but I mean, that, that, that's, that's part and parcel of what goes on. Automated de-checking about these drift kinds of conditions are very, very tricky. And so basically, we provide this thing that we, we have inside called Dashboard, which is basically telling you every time there's a run, how, what are all the descriptive statistics that may indicate that something has gone wrong? Now, this is not a very compelling answer to say, like, this is an automatically solved problem. But I'm saying it's something we're aware of, and we've built lots of tools. We just don't have any good ideas. We have lots of bad ideas we've tried, but none that really have actually worked. So that's a great point. Thanks, Chris. And uh, this also ends the session. Thanks to all the speakers.